okay so the end of the last lecture we were talking about the branch metric okay so let's see real quick how to compute this how do you what's the first step we can do let's see who's going to tell me the very first step what can we do any ideas condition s l plus 1 okay so that seems like an interesting suggestion so so write it as probability of s l plus 1 equals s given s l equals s prime times probability of r l given is this what you wanted to say condition on s l plus 1 s l equals s prime comma s l plus 1 equals s okay this seems like a natural good thing to try right so no no is it okay This is correct. Correct. Expression is correct. What use is this? <laughs> okay. What about this guy? What is what is s s comma s prime? Remember, so yeah. So it's just a trellis. Always think in terms of the trellis. Okay. So you're thinking of s prime here and s here, and then asking what is the probability that s l plus one equals s given s was l was s prime. What is this probability? So. It's going to be one by two, right? It's the probability of whether the input was zero or one. Okay, so there was only one bit. There was only one bit input here. Okay, so it could be either zero or one. So it's basically the probability of U L. Okay, so this is going to be U uh, L slash some output, right? Corresponding output. So I'll write down the output soon enough. But U L is this. So this term is basically probability that U L equals Uh, what, <laughs> whatever that should be, right? Right. So remember this. What what happened? The input here is a random variable U L. So that U L has to correspond to whatever was on that uh, branch. Okay. So so I don't know. I mean, we can have some notation for it. What notation can we have? Okay. So let me say U of S prime to S. Okay. So that's all. So that's the input corresponding to the branch S prime to S. Okay, so it could be the zero or one. So this is this is the a priori probability. Okay, so this is going to be half, half with no without any other information. Okay, so keep this in mind. This term we will revisit later when we talk about turbo codes. Okay, when we decode, there might be something here. There might be some other information that you might get on this. Okay, if you don't have any other information. a priori you have to say it's half i mean nothing else you can do about it okay so usually it's going to be half what about this guy this even these two i know the mean yeah so it's going to be some normal distribution right see remember s prime to s is some branch there was an input and there'll be an output okay so what is the input and the output we're going to we, let's write that down we're going to say this input is u of s prime to s and we can say the output will be yeah some i think the notation have used is what what notation have i used for it v right v of s prime to s okay so that is the output okay so this v will correspond after bpsk encoding it will correspond to either some plus 1 minus 1 minus 1 plus 1 or something okay so that those were the two transmitted symbols okay rl is basically rl1 and rl2 Okay, so that's what that's how you compute. So this will be basically uh, probability of R L one comma R L two given what given uh, V V one S prime to S comma 
v 2 s prime to s. Okay. Right. So, this output will have two bits, those two bits are getting BPSK encoded and then sent on the channel to get RL1 and RL2 and that is exactly this guy. Okay. How will you compute this? Okay. So, I will have a BPSK encoded version of this. Okay. So, the BPSK encoded version of this, the BPSK encoded version of this we can use some notation. Is there any notation that we have used for the BPSK encoded version y you know y. So, it is going to be y1 s prime to s y2 s prime to s i'll simply use y1 y2 okay it's not too confusing use y1 y2 basically rl1 is gaussian distributed with mean y1 s prime to s and rl2 is gaussian distributed with mean y2 s prime to s only that variance is important and you can simply compute the and these two are also independent right so you have a two bivariate Gaussian which is independent. So, it is simply a product of each of those things. Okay. So, this will work out very easily to the following. So, let me write that down finally probability of R L given S prime S will basically be 1 by two pi sigma squared. Okay, how did I get 2 pi sigma square? It is root 2 pi sigma squared. Okay, and then you will have e power minus what? R 1 minus R 1 L minus y 1 squared plus R 2 L minus y 2 squared by 2 sigma squared. Okay, remember this minus is for everything. Okay, that is the formula for uh, this probability. Is that okay? So, the branch metric for BCJR is computed like this, all right. So, the difference between the BCJR and the Viterbi algorithm in terms of the branch metric is in the Viterbi, you do not need sigma for computing the branch metric, you do not need to know the channel noise variance. In the BCJR, you have to know the channel noise variance. If you do not have sigma, you cannot compute this. Okay. So, one can argue that this is a inconsequential factor. Why is this inconsequen inconsequential? Okay. It can be dropped okay. because it will be there in every possible term that you compute and finally, when you compute the LLR, it will cancel. Okay. You, you will do a numerator and a denominator and it will cancel finally in the LLR. There is no problem. Okay, so, that can be dropped. So, sigma square does not show up there, but it shows up inside the exponential and you cannot drop it or you cannot cancel it in any which way you want. Okay, so, it is going to show up in uh, in the computation and you need sigma square for computing the branch metric in uh, in the in the BCJR algorithm. Of course, this is not the branch metric by itself. You have to multiply this with half, right? half if you have no a priori information or if you have some a priori information that will have to be multiplied. So, that is an observation. How do you compute sigma square? How not compute, how do you the right word is estimate sigma square? Right? Yeah, so you have to estimate sigma square. So, given given your received values, you can estimate it in several ways. There are standard algorithms. If you are taking the if you did you take if you took the estimation theory course that would offered when was it offered last semester or something he would have learnt about this estimating parameters is a standard uh, standard thing there. so there are ways of doing it to any degree of accuracy so you can estimate sigma squared okay so once you estimate it you can plug it into your formula okay so usually how it's done in receivers today is you look at your received values okay r1 r2 so on and from those values itself you estimate your sigma squared first okay you do that with some reliability and then you use it once again in the computation. That is a very standard method that is used in receiver implementations. The advantage to doing that is then your decoder block is independent of anything else that you have in the decoder in your receiver implementation. Okay. It might have so many other blocks. You might want to just independently estimate sigma square in your own way inside your decoder and implement it. That is one way of doing it. There could be other ways which are more interesting and for people to look at, but this is one way of doing it. Okay. 
all right so let me quickly summarize how this is going to work out in the lth stage and in the how the bcjr algorithm is going to work out okay you're going to first have the forward step okay the first step is the forward recursion okay the first step before all of that is branch metric computation okay that's the first step okay so once you do that the gammas for every single branch in your trellis in your entire trellis has been computed okay so you do that first the next step is forward step what do you do in the forward step you first start at the zeroth stage okay so at stage 0 how will you start at stage 0 you put 1 here and put everything else as 0 okay these are the alphas so forward step you compute alphas right okay at stage 0 you start with this that's how you start your recursion and then in the lth stage what do you do you basically use the recursion okay and then so on use recursion to compute all your alphas okay so you go through and compute all your alphas remember when you terminate the alpha computation will slightly change okay you will compute only for the sub part of the trellis which is really retained in your termination okay but you can do that okay. and then what do you do in the backward step or let us call it the reverse step it is also called the backward step at the last stage stage k plus 1 on the right of it what do you do you put 1 for the betas so this is for computing betas and then you put zeros here for the remaining states and then use recursion okay all right so after the branch metrics have been computed you can do the forward recursion you can also do the backward recursion once you have finished branch metric computation you know the gammas once you have finished forward steps you know the alphas once you have fixed finished the backward step you know the betas so what can you do now finally compute llrs okay so i'll show you how to compute the llr for the lth stage In the lth stage okay you have a bunch of states you have the alpha l minus 1 on this side and then you have the beta l on this side and you have the gamma l in the middle branch matrix okay the branch matrix are in the middle the forward state occupation probabilities are to the left and the backward state occupation probabilities are to the right okay how do you compute llr for ul okay the input in the lth stage you have to have a summation in the numerator over all s prime s such that input equals 0 and what will you multiply it at here you have s prime gamma l s prime comma s beta l of s and then what will you do here okay of course i forgot the log <laughs> the log is all important Okay, s prime s such that input equals 1 okay, and then you do the same expression okay that is it and now you have soft information on each of your message bits. In this final expression, it is also clear why any arbitrary scaling of gammas does not matter, right. I had the 1 by 2 pi sigma squared, right. If I had some scaling for every gamma, then clearly in the ratio it is going to cancel, okay. So, in the LLR computation, the constant outside factor does not play any role. So, I can drop the 1 by 2 pi sigma squared, okay. The exponential obviously I cannot drop, okay. So, it will play, it will play an important role, okay. Any questions on BCJR? Okay, so given if you if you have enough experience coding in MATLAB or C or any language, 
it should be quite trivial for you to write a program for BCJR. Okay, so it's not so difficult. At least you can write it down. What problems do you think you'll face if you write it on a computer which obviously has limited precision? What what problem will you have? Yeah, okay. So there'll be problems in overflow, underflow, etc. Okay. So for instance, your k as your k increases, what do you think will happen to these alphas and betas? Okay, gamma is going to be fairly well behaved. Okay, so there's no problem. What will happen to the alphas and betas for large k? Okay, remember these are probabilities, and there is a comma. This join probability for a long vector. Okay, and r is actually a huge vector. Okay, so everything is going to go down in probability. Okay, in value, everything is going to keep on dropping, and eventually values will become so low that you can't rely on any computation. Okay, so it's very common in for computation purposes to not implement this uh, BCJR algorithm in the probability domain with alpha, beta, gamma as probability, but usually people implement it in the log of probability domain. Okay. So, you simply take log of everything. Okay. You take log of everything. So, instead of alpha, you keep log alpha, but then what will happen to the recursion? There is a problem there. Look at, look at the recursion. How do you deal with the recursion? Okay. It has a summation. Okay. Summation is not very well behaved with logarithm, so that will be a problem, okay. but you deal with it. Okay, you do that computation. It it can be done in a smart way if you like. There is a smart way to do this recursion. Okay, summation of products when you take logarithm, when everything is uh, log. Okay, so you put log instead of gamma also. You take log of that also. Okay, so you have log of sum of exponentials. Okay, there are easy ways of implementing that. In VLSI, there is a way in which you can implement it in a smart way, for instance. So there is this, this interesting ways of doing that. I'm not going to talk about it in detail here, but that is how it is usually implemented when you write a program, you keep log of everything. Okay. When you do that, then your precision does not matter, right? log is quite uh, covers a wide range with good accuracy, so you do not mind at all. Okay. So, that is something that is done. So, so that is something to keep in mind. Okay. So, uh, in implementation, Use log alpha, log gamma, and log beta, and suitably change change recursion. Okay, so in that one operation that you have to do is log of summation of exponentials, right? So something like this you have to do. Okay, log of e power x plus e power y right am i right okay so this is the this is an expression that you have to compute again and again when you do when you do it in recursion when you do it in logarithm domain do you see that when you do the recursion it's alpha summation of two products you have to do log of e power x plus e power y maybe not just e power x plus e power y but several other terms but that is just a repetition of this once you do this everything else is also the same do you see that okay so this is the crucial operation there is a way to write this. So, this is usually denoted as, uh, so you can show an interesting property here. So, let me just quickly look it up and write down what this property is. It is not too difficult to prove. You can show this is, uh, this is basically max of x comma y plus log of 1 plus e power minus mod x minus y. Okay. You can show this. Okay. So, this is a quite an easy relationship to show, try to prove this. Okay. So, for this reason, this operation is usually denoted max star, okay. max with a star on top. The reason is it is related to the max, but with an alteration, okay. but how large will this value be? What is the largest possible value for log of 1 plus e power minus mod x minus y? Log 2, right. So, what is log 2? No, oh, well, base e, I am talking about base e. So, okay. so it is not very large, okay. so it is less than 1, definitely, right. So, is it less than 1? Yeah, it is less than 1. Okay. So, 0.67 something, whatever. Okay. So, so, it is almost max except for a small alteration okay right do you see that 1 plus e power minus mod something right so it cannot really go very large okay maximum value for this is 2 right 1 plus 1 2 
log 2 base e is also very small okay so it cannot be it cannot be very uh, large number so it's almost like max okay except for this nonlinear term that is adjusted so that's why i said going to the log domain is not a big deal even in vlsi all you have to do is implement this uh, log lookup and that too it's a very small function and you can do it very easily okay so you do that then you get this approximation okay so what people do further in implementation is what what is the most obvious thing you can do here simply drop that extra addition okay just throw that extra addition term away I mean, who cares about that it's anyway between less than 1 simply keep it as max okay so now there are several advantages if you simply keep it as max what is the first advantage okay computation is obviously simpler but what is what else can you think of as another advantage okay the dominating alpha so is sort of bound. No, actually, the one of the problems I pointed out here in the branch metric computation goes away if you replace it with max. Okay, so what happens when you take log of this? Remember, I'm taking log, right? When I take log of this, my branch metric will simply be some squared distance divided by two sigma square. If I take max, the division by two sigma square is is irrelevant. Okay, so I can throw the sigma square term out and I do not even need that. Okay. So that is another advantage in not doing not doing that extra nonlinear term and only doing max, okay, which which max does not change with nonlinear constant scaling and positive scale. Okay. So as long as you do that, max is uh, max is enough. So you throw away this nonlinear term, and that version of the decoder is called max log map. Okay. So this entire thing is called log map. Or log MAP. If you do the log implementation, it's called log MAP. Okay. For that, you use max star. If you drop this extra additional term and only use max, that is called max log map. Okay. So, I think most people who implement BCJR on actual hardware use max log map. Okay. Very few people use log map. Okay. There are huge advantages to it. There is, of course, a performance penalty. Okay. It's not as good as the map, log map there will be some penalty but there are so many advantages that you live with it okay. and there are addition there are approximations you know what people will do is they won't just take max they'll do a minor adjustment there will be an arbitrary adjustment that's done to max to make it little bit better there are, so you can really make that gap go away by doing these ad hoc things and making it really really good okay there are papers several papers that are written on max log map so you can look it up and you'll know what to implement okay so at least the implementations that we have done in the department use max log map okay it makes a lot of sense works very well okay so that's uh, i think all i wanted to say about implementation bcjr etc okay any questions okay like i said i mean you have to write a program to implement these things okay you can write a very short matlab code it won't even take more than a few lines okay it's just it's just some one loop for the forward recursion one loop for the backward recursion and you should not be computing gamma first for everything okay so when you implement of course i wrote it down like this you're not going to compute gamma everywhere and then store it you will compute it as you as and when you need it for the computation okay stage by stage you can go okay another problem in implementation is if your k is very large if you have 1000 or something then you have to remember too many alphas okay the memory you need in your implementation will be very very large so how do you overcome that Well, no alphas you can't compute as and when you need it. You need at least one direction fully compute and stored. Okay, then betas you can compute as and when you need it, but alphas you cannot. One way or the other, you can you, you can only compute one thing. So what is the? Uh, we have seen this before with Viterbi also. What? How do you overcome this long storage requirement? Yeah, difference. You, you do something called windowing. Okay, so windowing is the crucial idea. So you start for at a point, go up to a certain point, and then simply start your backward <coughs> recursion there but how can i start my backward recursion anywhere i want i mean because i cannot do an initialization no what can i do assume yeah assume equal probability go large long enough and then assume equal probability come back in your backward recursion for a few stages without really using that data okay and then after a while your betas will become good enough and then you can use them okay so the same windowing idea is used in implementation okay so almost all implementations use uh, like I said, max log map with windowing. Okay, so this is a good compromise, and it works quite well. Okay.
okay windowing is to make sure you do not have to store a huge number of uh, alphas as you go through the trellis in one direction okay. So, that is something it has to be carefully done you cannot you cannot just stop anywhere because you have to assign some betas carefully. So, you stop a little bit further ahead then come back and go ahead and do that. So, okay. So, the question is comparing ML and MAP. ML and MAP if you actually compare and plot they will look pretty much identical they will be on top of each other at least uh, in whatever that I have done I have seen with convolutional codes it is it is on top of each other there will be really no big change okay. But clearly the optimality is different okay. MAP is optimal for bit error probability okay. ML is optimal for block error probability remember the MAP decoder is not constrained to output any valid path on the trellis it will not output a valid path it need not necessarily output a valid path but it will you know I mean you know I mean so you have to be careful when you talk about the trellis here trellis you are directly outputting a message vector only okay. So, if you do that then of course it will be a valid path okay but if you also compute the parities and do MAP for that it may not be on the path okay. so that is one thing. Okay. So, but in the BCGR clearly you are computing only message when you are computing only message then you are then you are okay not a problem you will be you will be getting valid paths that is that is not a big deal okay. But in general the MAP is not it is not not will not necessarily give you the best uh, path on the trellis it will only give you the best set of bits okay. So, all the advantage in this here because complexity is yeah for convolutional codes themselves like I said nobody does uh, BCJR for convolutional codes if they are part of a bigger construction then you will see the advantage I will talk about it in turbo codes it makes a big difference when you need soft decisions you have to do BCGR okay yeah you will need LLRs for the message bits not just the not just what it is okay you want you want also some LLRs then at that point you need BCGR because Viterbi will not give you LLRs okay any other questions. To go about M -com. To go about? M -com. M -com oh, what do you do if it is not BPSK that is the question okay. So, the formulas essentially are the same. So, if you look at the way I derived it up to the alpha beta gamma I never used any BPSK only in the final expression for the branch metric gamma I use BPSK okay. So, you can go back and think about that okay up to this formula there is no use of BPSK. If you are doing QAM and all that first of all you how do you do convol from convolutional codes to QAM you, have, you will have some mapping right. So, bits will get mapped to the symbols that will play a role in these probability computations that is all. So, this up to this computation everything is valid you have to change your branch metric computation depending on your mapping in the QAM and other things okay and there are ways of doing it people have studied that and max log map approximations are there for that every all kinds of approximations it is a very well studied subject. So, that is an important question because in going with 4G etcetera people are doing up to 64 QAM even in wireless okay. so, it is unheard of before but people are doing all these huge constellations. So, you will be facing those kind of problems if you are implementing these things. So, it is good to know what to do in QAM like I said everything else is valid only depends on the Markov chain properties the only thing is when you compute the branch metrics you have to use your mapping that is all or depending on the mapping it will change. Maybe I will comment about QAM computations later on okay. So, I will talk about something else later on okay, how to do for something other than BPSK. Are we looking at synchronized probabilities there or do we say probability see we used uh, u, u equals 0 or 1 does it does that increase u 0 1 2 3 4 u if you do QAM. So, uh, usually not I mean people will do bit only okay. So, Okay, so I will comment on that later also okay. So, usually the latest the modern way of doing uh, uh, doing modulation and coding is to make sure that they do not interfere with each other you know I mean you do the code only in binary and then you convert from binary to QAM. So, it is only this okay. okay. So, if we are done with questions on BCJR I want to just quickly summarize okay summarize convolutional codes. Okay, what is the main selling point of convolutional codes why are why are they okay simple simple encoder okay. So, that is the first 
selling point very very simple encoder if you want to have a very very cheap error connecting code which is also good then the encoder is simplest in convolution codes it is very hard to beat it okay, there is no way you can beat that and in addition what is the matching property of the decoder which is crucial low complexity soft ml decoding soft optimal decoders of low complexity. Okay, so, these two are major major selling points it is a great great combination and they provide good performance, but if you remember in some of the plots I showed you convolutional codes by themselves after so much research and lots of work they do not get close to capacity. There is always like a 3, 4, 3 dB gap at least okay, 3 or 4 dB gap from capacity. Okay, so, they, they do not get to capacity, but in practice very few people try to get to capacity because capacity is like a 0 dB, 1 dB. Okay, so, that is really low SNR for many other things in your receiver chain. Okay, so, your receiver chain is not just your encoder and decoder right what else I mean you must be studying digital communication what else is there in your receiver chain what is very crucial what else can be crucial you have to recover carrier you have to recover timing okay so all those things nobody knows whether they will work at 0 db 1 db okay so for a long time they were also not very so robust that they can work at 0 db and 1 db and all that okay so, so many other things are there I mean, you have to first of all detect whether some communication is happening where are your frames where you begin where you end and so many other things are involved lots of signal processing is involved before you can start your decoder okay so just because your decoder works at 0 db it doesn't mean everything else will work okay so that those were problems so because of that people when they don't want to stretch everything in their signal processing to its limits simply work with convolutional codes and it, it works very well okay? there's no problem there okay and uh, the trellis plays an important role trellis is a uh, a crucial uh, thing that enables everything in a way okay so that is it okay so what we are going to see next is uh, turbo codes okay so of course they are quite storied today okay so everybody is at least is showing some hint of a smile when I mentioned turbo codes you are happy to see that they are talking about turbo codes okay so like I said for a long time people we are talking thinking the convolution codes or any other codes that you can have will not really get to capacity okay there was this talk of something called a cutoff rate computational cutoff rate they are saying there is some other capacity which is not really capacity it's a little bit farther away from capacity which is the best you can do okay and then in 93 or 94 I think when did the paper come I think I can't remember maybe 92 okay early 90s there was this paper from uh, at that time a little known French group I should say okay so it was from France and it had authors who were from I think there was one author from Thailand okay, and three others were French okay. So, it was a collaboration Claude Barrault was the main guy as it turned out later okay. So, so it got published and they said they showed performance very close to capacity 1 dB, 1.5 dB and all that for a long time people were shocked and nobody understood what was going on and then the whole revolution started. So, today going to capacity is not considered a a serious uh, I mean it is actually considered a serious requisite you know, if you are building a communication system everybody asks how far you are from capacity to okay. So, it is come to that level okay. So, all of that started with this turbo codes. So, so obviously now our understanding of turbo codes is also better, but when they originally presented it may not have been in this way, but right now the understanding is the, the current one and that is what I am going to talk about and the, the idea is so simple, so elegant and interesting hopefully it appeals to you and you like it. So, turbo codes is what we are going to see next. Okay, so the main idea here is concatenation. That is the first main idea of convolutional codes with message interleaving. Okay, so, these two words are keywords here. Okay. So, you do concatenation Okay, and then you interleave messages. Okay, so, I will be describing what is called parallel concatenation, there is also something called serial concatenation. 
but parallel is what I will be describing because that is what is used today and that is turned out to be good in many ways. Okay. Of course, that is not to mean the other concatenations are not good, but parallel concatenation is accepted today as uh, something very nice. Okay. So, once again I will start with a simple example of a turbo encoder. Okay. So, like convolutional encoders we will not talk about turbo codes directly, we will talk about turbo encoders and then the codes that they produce will be the turbo codes. Okay. So, how does the turbo code look like? So, what I have said here there are convolutional codes. So, of course, there is a convolutional code. So, we will say we will use rate half convolutional codes. Okay. And with a recursive systematic encoder. Okay. So, that is also commonly used. Okay, so, this will be the convolutional code that we will use. Okay. So, you can for an example keep that standard example in mind. Okay. So, if you want an example you can think of g of d equals 1 plus d squared by 1 plus d plus d squared and 1. Okay. So, this is a this is an encoder. Okay. So, I will basically denote this by a picture like this. Okay, so, rate half I will say C C for convolutional code I will put one input and then I will put two outputs. Okay. So, if this is u this is going to be u and this will be a parity which I will denote as p. Okay. Is it all right? So, that is a systematic code systematic encoder. So, if you have u u is going to come out and then there is going to be a parity. Okay, so, this is my convolutional code. So, now this is going to get what, what is known as parallel concatenated. So, how does that work? Let me show you. Okay, so, you suppose you have a message u which is u 0, u 1 all the way to u k minus 1. Okay. u is first going to go through a rate half convolutional code and you would get u here and then k minus 1. Uh, yeah, so I have to write down u k plus u k and u k plus 1, right. Okay, do I have to? Yeah, I have to because it's the it's a recursive code, and I have to put in two things which are. So now I can't just say zero here. Okay, so it's something else which is not zero. Okay. And then I get the first set of parities. I'll call this as P one. Okay, so of course there's only one parity per symbol, but let's still call it P one. Okay, so it's P one zero, P one one, all the way to P one k plus one. Okay. So, this is the next what comes next is the master stroke so to speak. Okay. So, what you do is you want to concatenate you want to do parallel concatenation, but before that you also want to interleave. Okay. So, you take the u and then do an interleaving. Okay. So, I will call it as an interleaver. What does an interleaver do? It just permutes the bits in u randomly okay. and the interleaver has to be sufficiently random it cannot be very deterministic it cannot be that it switches everything in a very deterministic way. Okay. It has to be very random. Okay. So, that is the first uh, condition, but I am not saying that now you just simply say interleaver you assume this to be random. Okay. So, some kind of a random interleaver and then what do you do? The interleaved version. So, usually it is very common to denote permutations by pi. Okay. So, I will say the interleaved version is pi of u. Now, this will go through another rate half convolutional code. Okay. So, in general it can be another code, but it is very common today to use the same code. Okay. So, you use the same encoder as before. Okay. So, now this will put out two outputs. Right. One of them will simply be pi of u and that is already there. Okay. So, you can simply drop that and only take the parity which I will denote as P 2. Okay, so, you have P 2 0, P 
be two ones so one two p two k plus one okay now there is something which is a bit some somebody might ask think of this i don't know if any of you got if any of you are going to think about it okay how will the receiver know Permutation is known to the receiver. Code constriction is not. Okay, I just wanted to talk about the zero termination here. So you might be able to zero terminate the first encoder. You may not be able to necessarily zero terminate the second encoder, right? So you just do. Maybe you zero terminate. Maybe you don't. Maybe you terminate to something. Okay, or maybe you simply stop at k minus one. Okay, even you don't have to really go to k plus one. Okay, maybe you zero terminate. Maybe you don't. You may not be able to do both of that. Okay, so so there's a problem there, right? So do you see the problem? See, if I don't, if I zero terminate, what will happen? I have to send two more bits. Okay, so maybe you maybe you do that. Okay, so there's some 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 issue about zero termination here, right? So I said I'm going to ignore the systematic form. If I ignore the systematic bit, then clearly the zero termination is a problem. I have to send at least two bits from there. Okay, the zero terminated bits. If you decide to drop that also, then you may not be able to zero terminate here. Okay, so all these things are issues, but these are just minor issues that affect you in a very small way. Okay, so usually usual practice is to not zero terminate the second encoder. Is that okay? The normal practice is to not zero terminate the second encoder, but to zero terminate the first encoder. Is that okay? Okay, so you zero terminate the first encoder, and then your interleaver will have length k plus one. Okay, k plus two or whatever. Let me say, you know. The entire all the bits will be interleaved and sent through the second one, and you produce whatever parities. It ends in whatever state. It doesn't matter. Okay, so you don't zero terminate the second encoder. Okay, that's a common practice. But it's also possible to zero terminate the second one also, which means in that case you have to send two more bits, the zero termination bits for the second encoder explicitly, and that will reduce your rate a little bit. It may not matter in the end. Okay, all right. So there is the zero termination issue, but common practice is to zero terminate the First encoder and not worry about what happens in the second encoder. It can end in some arbitrary state. It doesn't matter. Okay. So then, what's the output? Final code word is. If you want to write it as v, it's basically what u zero, p one zero, p two zero, u one, p one one, p two one. So on. So until u k plus one, p one k plus one. Is there a problem with what I wrote now? What do you mean by random? Yeah, it's fixed. It's a fixed random permutation. Random looking. Okay, so let me say random looking, fixed permutation. It should not be a simple formula. That's I mean simple linear or very easy formula. Okay, random looking. Fixed permutation. As it turns out, people use some quadratic formulas, okay, and that's good enough. Okay, it should not be some simple thing like every I, I put it in a row in, in a matrix and then put it in row wise and shift out column wise. Things like that you should not do. Okay, it cannot be a very regular fixed uh, regular kind of interleaving. It should be a random enough interleaving. Okay, so you pick something at random, it should look like. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to talk about that. So clearly, the overall rate is one by three. Okay, and this is something that you might want to live with, but usually current practice is to not go to that rate one by three code. Okay, what people do is you puncture. Okay, so the common way of puncturing is to say that I'll drop this guy, I'll drop this guy. Okay, you drop all the even numbered bits in here in P two and drop all the odd numbered bits in P one. Then what will happen to the rate? You get half. Okay, so you drop. Drop odd numbered parity bits. Okay, you drop even numbered parities. Okay, so this is the common practice. But even if you don't, you have a rate one by three turbo code. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Usually you drop these things and you get a rate half turbo code. Okay, so this will give you rate half turbo code. 
this is obviously a rate 1 by 3 turbo coil. Okay. So, what is the I mean what is how could you probably justify this construction I mean what is the motivation behind doing this interleaving and concatenation. Any ideas? Even the interleaved also the P the parity should be the same. That mean, be the same. I mean, mean in some other order, they will also. Be okay, well, it's, they won't be the same. I mean, when you change the order, the parities, the way they show up is completely different, right? So it will be some other kind of bit. What is the idea? Noise, which noise? Oh, over, oh, oh, okay. Noise is random. So. Okay, all right. So all these things are. I mean, I don't know. It sounds interesting to me, but I mean, it's not. Of course, the decoder is important. Okay, so you can do a decoding. That's important. But more than that, from an encoder point of view, what is it about this which is interesting? So remember, one of the points I made when I talked about good codes is, you really don't know good codes. Okay, bad codes you can easily find, but good codes we don't know very well. Okay. Okay, so so how easy is it to find a low weight code word here? That's my question. Okay, how can you find a low weight code word? So let's try and repeat the convolutional code ideas. Okay, suppose I put in a weight one input. Clearly, the first systematic uh, recursive encoder itself will kill it. I mean, it will give you a long weight code word out. Okay, so you can't put weight one. Okay, how did we get low weight code words for weight uh, recursive convolutional codes? We had to use weight two. Okay. And not all weight two code words, weight two messages result in a low weight code word. Okay, only a one third of them or something. So you have to find, pick the gap between the two, very carefully. Only at some gaps you will get low weight code words. Now what is the interleaver doing? Suppose I put in a low weight message, weight two message with the critical gap, which will kill my first encoder and give out a very low weight code word. The interleaver is going to be a random thing. So with very high probability, what is going to do? What is it going to do? It's going to make that gap bad for the, or good for the, second recursive systematic encoder. So I'm going to get a long weight code word on that side. Okay. So it might even be possible to actually fix an interleaver, <coughs> which will always do that. Okay. Maybe it's not possible. I don't know. <laughs> okay. It might be possible. May, may, so at least it will be possible to come up with an interleaver, which will, with very high probability, always do that for weight two inputs. Okay, then it becomes much harder to find a weight two input which will give you a low weight code word. Okay, right? Slowly, as you go to larger and larger weights of input, eventually your code word will anyway become long, and then you can't do much about. It. Okay, so at least from this rule of thumb point of view, it's not so easy to come up with a low weight code word for this construction. Okay, so that's the first thing that we can be happy about in the turbo encoder construction. But that's just the starting point. Okay, the main thing will be the decoder. Okay, so okay, we have constructed this fancy-looking encoder. How can we do decoding? Okay, so that's where the idea of concatenation once again helps you. Okay, so if you remember, I pointed out in concatenation, the main idea is you don't have to decode the overall code. What do you do? You decode the smaller code, and then use that information in decoding the other code. And it turns out the crucial idea that these guys used was this turbo idea. Okay, so you go from one decoder to the other decoder, and then you do what? You come back to the first decoder, and then you repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat and improve your decoding performance. Okay, so once you do that, this code also has capacity approaching performance and bit error rate and all that. Okay, so we'll talk about a little bit more about the encoder, and then more details about the decoder tomorrow. Okay, so this is the end.